This is The Arm of the Starfish, Chapter 19. This way, Molek said, and Adam followed helplessly. Now, now, the man who had been trying to direct him called and pointed in the opposite direction. Molek scowled, speaking rapidly and angrily. The man responded shrilly, flung up his hands in exasperation, and strode off. Where are you taking me? Adam demanded. Padre Ball. There was nothing to do but go with him. Molek led Adam back to where the limousine was just pulling away to return to the airport. Parked nearby was Mr. Cutter's car. Adam would not easily forget this car, and he had no desire to get into it again. But he clenched his teeth and climbed in as Molek opened the door to the back seat. If Mr. Putter Cutter was going to meet him, meet me, why didn't he tell me? Adam thought. Or is this some kind of test or trick? He looked out the window, trying to see something he recognized, trying to remember the route, to see street signs, but he realized that as far as finding his way around Lisbon was concerned, he was completely helpless. Squares with fountains, sidewalks in mosaic patterns, laundry hanging, fountains splashing, all seemed to flash by him in an unassimilated jumble as Molek drove. Hey, Greja, Molek said, pulling up abruptly in front of a gray stone cross-shaped, cross-topped building on a broad tree-lined street somewhere on the outskirts of Lisbon though at which point of the compass Adam did not know. His sense of direction had completely forsaken him. Once he could study the map, he would feel a little more secure. A narrow, cobblestoned street led to a modern villa behind the church, and to this the chauffeur pointed. Padre Ball. Obrigado, Adam said quitted the cutter's car and Molek with a sense of relief and walked quickly over the cobblestones. The villa was a handsome one, large, faced with patterned tiles in Venetian red. He rang the bell and the door was opened almost immediately by Dr. Ball himself, who grasped Adam's hand in his unusual overhearty grip. Dear lad, I'm so grateful that you're here safely. So Molek found you. Adam retrieved his hand. Dr. Ball led him along a narrow corridor into a large study. It was a light and cheerful room filled with books and leather-covered leather furniture. Although it did not seem to Adam to reflect Dr. Ball's personality at all, it was no doubt the kind of study that the rector thought he ought to have. He sat down at his large leather-top desk, indicated a comfortable chair near him, and showed his teeth in a smile. We should have thought of having Malek meet you when we talked with you last week, but alas, we did not, and both Mr. Cutter and I felt that a phone call to you would be most unwise under the circumstances and that we just have to trust Molette to find you. He's a most reliable fellow. Though I'm sure you'd have managed to get to me anyhow, wouldn't you? Well, I think so, sir. As a matter of fact, I didn't see Molette right away, so I plan to look up your address in the phone book and then figure out how to get to you from the map. I'll tell the truth whenever possible, he thought, and when I can't, I'll try, to say, I'll try not to say anything at all. Clever boy, Dr. Ball told him. Are you hungry? Would you like something to eat? What can I get you? Nothing, thank you. I've had a good breakfast and I've arranged to meet Callie for lunch. Where are you meeting Callie? Perhaps it will simplify things if I show you on the map and tell you how to get there. That would be fine. It's a seafood restaurant called the Salo de Cha. He gave Dr. Ball the map and the rector spread it out on the desk. Ah, ah, yes, here we are. He indicated a central point. Here is the Salao de Cha. Here is the rectory. If you will walk three blocks east from here, thus, you will be able to 
get a number, a number 198 bus, which will take you to the Salao de Cha in about 10 minutes. Or perhaps it would be simpler just to take a taxi. Yes, yes, of course, that would be better. Well, no, thank you, sir. I think I'd rather take the bus. Why, boy? Don't, do you not have enough money? Dr. O'Keefe had given Adam a sizable rule. He answered promptly. Oh, yes, sir. I have the money for Mrs. O'Keefe's shopping, and I have my first week's salary, so I'm fine. Dr. Ball sniffed. O'Keefe is not known for overpaying his assistants. He took a wad of bills from his wallet and handed it to Adam. We took that into consideration, of course, so let it be no problem to you. I really don't want the money, sir. I don't care about taxis. Callie is not accustomed to ordering inexpensive lunches. I can manage. My dear lad, I think you should feel free to accept a little payment for what you are doing for us. I'd really rather not take the money. I appreciate your sentiments, dear boy. But accept it as a loan. If you don't need it, you can return it. But you may run into expenses you haven't anticipated. Further arguing would be suspicious, so Adam took the money, putting it gingerly into his pocket. About the taxi, I'd really rather take the bus so that I can learn my way around Lisbon a bit. It'll help give me the lay of the land. All very well and good if there's time. We shall see. Now for instructions. You have something for us? Yes. Some papers I managed to get from the file when it was unlocked. Shall I give them to you? Oh, no, Sonny. No, no, no. It wouldn't do at all for me to have the papers, nor would it be right for me to act as courier. You must understand that. I do what I can to help, of course, but my position naturally limits what it is fitting for me to do. Well, then... Adam let his voice trail off. He had a feeling that Dr. Ball was leading him around in circles with his questions, his bus numbers. The rector was like a well-fed cat who nevertheless enjoys playing with the mouse. Now Dr. Ball looked at his watch. 10.45. What time are you meeting Callie? 1. Very well. An edge came into the voice that made Adam feel that now they were getting down to business. They were through playing games. Professor Mbuste of Coimbra is upstairs. I will take you to him. He rose, looked at his watch, checked it against the clock on the mantelpiece, then led Adam through the quiet house and up a flight of back stairs. Professor Mbuste does not speak English, but his French is fluent. Yours? Pretty good. Splendid, splendid. Cutter and I were betting on it though we have an interpreter in the readiness. We prefer not to use an intermediary if we can avoid it. He paused on the landing. If Dr. Busti is satisfied with what you have for us, you will be free to meet Callie at the Slau de Cha, where you will receive further instructions. Further instructions? Adam asked blankly. Surely you didn't think your job would be over when you had delivered the papers. You are not that naive, nor young. And it will give, and, and this will give Professor Ambuste more time to go over the papers, Adam thought. Aloud, he said, I really don't think it's a question of naivete, Miss Dr. Ball. It seems to me that once I've delivered the papers, my use is over. You may be wanted for questioning. Dr. Ball stood up, started up a second narrower flight of stairs. Remember that you're, you work closely with O'Keefe. We may need to know more than his progress in the regeneration experiments. But what? There's nothing I know. You know his habits, what time he gets up, what, when he is out of the library, where he goes, when the files are unlocked. I see, Adam said slowly. It seems to me that Joshua would be lots more used to, to you than I, sir, since he's such a good friend of yours, and he's known Dr. O'Keefe so much longer. Perhaps this was a dangerous gambit, but it seemed to go along with the role Adam was trying to play. Dr. Ball cleared his throat, went up two more stairs, paused. Although our young friend Joshua is not a churchgoer, 
Alas, I consider that he is still within my parish, and therefore my responsibility spiritually. He is lost now, and so, despite my disapproval of his way of life, he is really no fit companion for you. I must... I must never, I must never abandon him. I would really prefer it if you did not see him. He hurried up the last few steps, walked down a short hall, knocked briskly at the door, and opened it to reveal a small, almost bare room. At the desk sat a man with a sallow, intelligent face. An unshaded light bulb hung over the desk. It reminded Adam of the room in the airport in Madrid. Without making any introductions, Dr. Wall closed the door on Adam and disappeared. Adam could hear the footsteps descending. The sallow man looked up and boosted. Adam Eddington, Adam said, looking at the professor. Professor and Boosted glared back. The corners of his mouth turned down in a bitter and unwelcoming expression. Adam had was becoming accustomed to being examined. So he stood his ground. Professor Mbuste did not ask him to sit down. Without moving his chair, he said, The papers, please. Adam handed them across the desk. You will wait, the professor said sourly while I look at them. Adam stood, watching the professor go through the papers, eyes flickering quickly over the formulas. Those eyes, small, close-set, dark in themselves, and darkly shadowed, seemed to Adam to be sharp, cruel, and frighteningly intelligent. Minutes moved, and Adam did not dare check his watch. He shifted uncomfortably from one foot to the other. But O'Keefe had prepared the papers well, for Professor and Bousté put them down on the desk, looked at Adam, and said, Very well, you may go. You will receive further instructions at the Slau de Chat. Adam felt that he could not get out of this small trap of a room quickly enough. He opened the door and came face to face with Dr. Ball. If the rector had descended audibly, he had come back up the stairs in his stocking feet. Putting a finger to his lips that were curved in a peculiar smile, he led Adam to the front door, then took his hand in a too strong grip. My dear good lad, I am immeasurably relieved that all is well. You still wish to take the bus? Yes, please. You remember the number? 198. Bright boy, we'll be in touch. Adam's hand was pumped. Blessings were rained upon his unwilling head, and he fled down the street. At the bus stop, a lonely young man waited. He wore heavy, horn-rimmed spectacles and carried a pile of books under his arm. He beamed at Adam and said in studied English, A million pardons, but are you an American? Yes, I am a student at the University of Lisbon and am taking courses in the English language and the literature of England and America. It is always my deepest pleasure to talk to students from either of these countries. The light glinted against his spectacles so that Adam could not see his eyes. I'd like to talk to you, Adam said, trying to sound courteous, but I'm in a terrible hurry. I'm off to meet a girl, and the last time we met, you know, we had a misunderstanding. Say, so see, his voice trailed off. The bespectacled student waved his books gleefully. A lover's quarrel. How delightful. So, of course, I understand that you are not interested in my idle chatter. Adam was spared a reply by the arrival of a bus. 198. What luck he thought gratefully. He smiled, waved courteously, jumped on, and ran up the stairs to sit on one of the front seats on the upper deck, then looked down the street. The student was no longer at the bus stop, so presumably he had boarded the bus too. 
but he had not come upstairs. Adam alterna alternately checked his watch and the map. It was already 11.30, but with luck he would be able to manage a phone call to the Sao Juan Chrysostom Monastery. He felt a terrible need to be in touch with Ken and Talos. Something about the professor and Boosty had frightened him, and although the false papers had for the moment been accepted, the boy knew that the professor must now be going over them more carefully. He left the bus, the Temis papers seeming to burn in Rolia's pocket, bumped by several young people who pushed out ahead of him and stood clustered on the sidewalk. He knew the papers had not been touched, but he still felt panic. The young people stood together talking animatedly, and he was not sure whether or not he was imagining sidelong glances. Some of the glances came from girls, and to this he was moderately accustomed. But was the boy with his back turned the young man with the glasses? Was Adam being watched as he walked quickly down the street? It was not yet twelve, he knew from the map where the restaurant was, but the walk there before but to walk there before calling would be cutting the time too close for comfort. He went into a small hotel and found a phone. It was not a closed booth, but no one, as far as he could tell, had followed him in. He struggled with the phone book and managed with considerable difficulty to find the number for the Sao Juan Chrysostom Monastery. With the help of the phrase book he was able to give the operator the number and after a good deal of clicking and clacking, he heard a distant ring. Then came a rough voice, and Adam said, Senor Paroco, Padre Enriquez, por favor. There was a long pause, during which Adam felt that everyone in the hotel lobby was staring at him. This he knew was not likely, and he would not be alert to the people who might really be following him if he was suspicious of everybody else. A gentle voice, an old voice, sounded in his ear. Padre Enriquez. Adam Eddington, Adam said. Can and tell us, por favor. Momento. A shorter pause. Then the familiar, brusque voice. Adam. Yes, where are you? Lobby of the Hotel Saul Mamand. How much time do you have? Until one. Lunch with Callie then? Yes. Are you being followed? I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just being too suspicious. I doubt it. Leave the hotel and turn right down Ro Rua Sao Mamede. Go into the coffee shop at number 28 over the Acolist. I'll be there as quickly as I can. A wave of relief broke over Adam as he hung up. He found the coffee shop without trouble. Climbing a steep flight of stairs to a long, narrow room filled with small tables. The table by the window was empty, and he sat there, looking out over the enormous gold spectacles that signified the Oculus office and shop below. Across the narrow street were more shops, a, tobacco, a tobacconist, a music store, a shoe store. Down the street, which seemed purely commercial, he saw the ubiquitous laundry hanging out. He ordered coffee and tried to appear relaxed and casual, but he could not keep from being look from looking out on the street. He did not know from which direction Canatalis would approach, so he would take a sip of coffee and look up the street, another sip and look down the street. He was looking down the street, leaning forward when he saw the cannon in the distance, when somebody sat down opposite him, and he turned thinking he must have been mistaken to be met by the beaming face of the student, student from the bus stop. But what good fortune to come across you here, the student cried. Perhaps I can be of assistance to you. It would be my unutterable delight. Where is you, your, what do you call it, girlfriend? I'm meeting her in a few minutes. Words came quickly, almost without thought, to Adam's lips. The bus was faster than I'd expected, and I don't want to be too early. Bad for them to think you're too eager, if you know what I mean. The student giggled convulsively. You Americans, you steal our girls right out from under our envious noses. 
we are all so poor that it is difficult for us on the surface to compete with you. And below the surface? The student shrugged apologetically. America is a rich country, and life is easy for you. But the ability to love a woman and to please her to the ultimate fullest comes only through centuries of experience and suffering. I think that in the inner matters of the heart, you have much to learn. He beamed at Adam as though he had paid him a great compliment. A dark figure moved deliberately by Adam, and the canon seated himself at the next table, so that Adam faced him, and the student had his back to him. Adam felt a moment of frantic frustration. He had a wild impulse to simply take the tennis papers from Maria's pocket and give them to the canon then and there. Canon Talis looked at him, raising what, if he had hair, would have been eyebrows. Adam stood up, saying rather loudly to the student, Well, it was very pleasant meeting you. It's time for me to go get my girl now, he could not resist adding, and I assure you that I, too, have more charm than money. The student burst into roars of laughter, slapping his knee in enormous appreciation. He, too, rose. Perhaps it would amuse you if I walk along with you and show you some of the particular points of interest. But you haven't had your coffee. The student shrugged and waved his arms in a windmill gesture. Coffee I can have any time. The chance to ex exercise my English and simultan simultaneously talk with an American is rare. Where are you meeting this lovely her? At the Slaude Chap. The student made a face. The Slaude Chap prefers money to charm. Oh, well, you know, Adam said. Girls. I won't eat for a month. Behind the back, behind the student's back, Canon Talis's lips moved silently. Phone. Adam's eyes met his for a brief moment of acquiescence. Then he paid for the coffee and left.